Studying calculus can be a very intimidating task. There are so many rules and formulas and procedures and notations and symbols, it can get quite overwhelming. If you've clicked on this video, you've likely found this yourself. You may be brand new to calculus and trying to understand it from a conceptual level. You might've been doing calculus a little while and you wanna deepen your knowledge about the subject, or you might be revisiting calculus for the first time in a long time. If any of these apply to you, this is the video to watch. In this video, I'm gonna be going through the conceptual ideas behind differentiation, what a derivative is, and what a derivative function is. I'm gonna be doing the entire thing without using any mathematical notation or symbols because I wanna teach you the concept so that when you get to the symbols and maths, it all makes sense. Finally, throughout chapters one and two, I will be using a Desmos file. If you'd like to follow along and play around with the Desmos file yourself, I've got a link to it in the video description. It's fully tangible. You can move the dots around and play with it. And there's instructions in the side panel. So check that out as well. Alrighty, here I have a curve which represents the temperature of a coffee cooling down over time. So my horizontal axis is T for time in minutes and my vertical axis is also T but capital T for temperature in degrees Celsius. Now the first thing we want to do is plot a couple of points on this curve. So I'm going to place the point when time equals five minutes and see the temperature there. And I'm also going to plot the time of 20 minutes and see what the temperature is there. Okay, now we have those two points. If we connect them with a line, we can represent the average rate of change of temperature between those two points. So it's going down in temperature and by a certain amount. If we, however, bring those points closer together, you can see that the difference between the line and the curve starts to get smaller. Now the line that goes through these two points is pretty different from the curve itself. Because the time periods are so far apart, it's not a very good representation at all. So what we can do is we can bring those time periods much closer together, start dragging those points closer. And as we do, you can see that that line is starting to represent that curve even better the closer we get. Now we're gonna to get to a point when those points are so close together that they're basically indistinguishable. However, thanks to the power of technology in Desmos, we can zoom in on those two points and see that they are different but you can also see that that straight line, that orange line that represents the average rate of change is more or less the same as the function line. Because we're so zoomed in, the function basically turns into a straight line. I will admit it is an approximation, but you can see it's quite a good one. Now, if we get those two points so close together that they are basically the same point, you can see that when we zoom right out of the function, the two points kind of just look like one point. And if we do indeed consider the difference between these two points so small, so negligible, that they are effectively one point, we get what's called the instantaneous rate of change. Now this is just a fancy way of saying the rate of change at more or less an instant in time. Now of course you can't have a rate of change at one point in time, but you can see where we're getting with these two points that are so close together. So when we graph that straight line that connects those two points, what we get is what we call a tangent to the curve. A tangent is just a straight line that touches the curve at exactly one spot. Now, if this tangent value is going downhill, that means it's gonna have a negative gradient. If it's going uphill, it's gonna have a positive gradient. And now finally, the moment you've been waiting for, at a point on a curve, the value of the gradient of the tangent is what we call the derivative at that point. Let me say that again. At a point on a curve, if we draw a tangent and then calculate its gradient, that number value is the derivative at that point. It is just the slope of a line. But that's not the whole story because what we can do is we can look at a collection of gradients, which gives us a gradient function, which is what we call the first derivative. 
Alrighty guys, just before we continue on, I just wanna let you know that my absolute favorite thing in the world to do is to teach students intuitively mathematical concepts so they understand rather than just do. If you feel like this video so far is doing that for you and you have a better understanding of what the derivative is, make sure you hit that like button. That's gonna tell YouTube that this video is good and helps you understand the derivative and it's gonna to spread to more and more students, which is gonna make me very happy. Thank you so much for watching. Let's get into chapter two. Alrighty, in chapter two, we're gonna be looking at a collection of gradients, which when put together makes a gradient function. On the graph next to me, we still have our orange tangent line, but it's gonna be joined by a blue and a green one also. Of course, I could put infinitely many different tangents on here, but for the sake of clutter and making it neat, I'm only gonna use three. Now these tangents all have different gradients. The blue one is quite a steep gradient and the green one's quite a flat gradient. The actual value of these gradients or the numerical value of these gradients can be plotted and I'm gonna do that down below each one of them now. Now the reason I say down below is because as you can see, all of the gradients have a negative numerical value and hence when we plot them, they are below the x-axis or the t-axis in this instance. I could move these values around, which I'll show now, and you can see as the point on the original function changes, its tangent line changes, and because of that, the derivative value changes along with it. If we ended up plotting infinitely many of these values instead of just three, we would end up getting something that resembled a curve, which I'm gonna plot now. This curve is what we call the derivative function of the original. It represents any derivative value at any point in time along this curve. This curve or this derivative function is typically what you get when a question says, find the derivative of this function. Incidentally, finding the derivative or going from some function to its derivative function is a process called differentiation. However, it means the exact same thing. It's just different terminology for the process. This concept of a derivative function is what you're probably used to seeing when you get a question that says, find the derivative of this function. It's essentially saying, find a curve which will represent any possible gradient value to any tangent on the original curve. That's it. So to summarize what we've learned so far, a tangent to a curve is a straight line which touches the curve at exactly one point. The gradient of this tangent line is the derivative at that point. If we take infinitely many derivatives across the entire function, we get what's called the derivative function or in general, just the derivative. If you get asked to calculate a derivative, this is what it's talking about. Now that we have this understanding of the derivative and the derivative function, let's consider a few situations where knowing about the derivative is quite handy. One of the most common scenarios where using the derivative comes in handy is when we're trying to model the motion of a particle or object. Being able to determine the derivative tells us information about that particle's rate of change of position, otherwise known as velocity. And the magnitude of this velocity is known as speed. So we, knowing about the derivative, can figure out all the information we need to know about the object's speed. So when is it traveling the fastest? When is it traveling the slowest? When is it stationary? Furthermore, if you determine the derivative of the derivative of position, or in other words, the derivative of velocity, you can find out information about the acceleration of an object. So when is it accelerating the fastest? When is it accelerating the slowest? When is it not accelerating at all? All sorts of problems like these are gonna pop up when you're studying mathematics. So knowing about the derivative and understanding what it is is super helpful in this area. Another area of mathematics where knowing about the first derivative is really handy is something called optimization. Next to me, I've got a diagram of where a farmer's going to be keeping some livestock. Now they know how much fencing they can use and they know this is the shape that they wanna make the paddock. The question becomes, what is the maximum area that they can fence off using this shape? 
Turns out the first derivative can help us solve these sorts of problems. Over here, I have a representation on Desmos of this same problem where the x-axis is the radius of that semicircle on top and the y-axis is the area. And you can see that the area grows and grows and grows and grows and grows until a particular point and then it starts dropping again. Now, graphically through inspection, we can kind of see where that area is maximized. However, if we don't have the luxury of having the diagram, we can use the first derivative to help us solve this problem. As you can see, if we draw a tangent at the very peak of that function, the gradient is actually zero. So essentially we're trying to solve for when the first derivative equals zero, because remember, the derivative function tells us the gradient of a tangent line. We want the tangent line to be zero and hence the derivative must be zero. One final area of mathematics that uses the first derivative a lot, especially in high school and university studies is population analysis. The growth and decay of populations is a really, really big thing at the moment, especially with climate change. And knowing how to interpret and analyze these population growths and decays is really important. Just like the first derivative can help us determine the rate of change of position or speed, or it can help us determine the rate of change of area in optimization problems. The first derivative can help us determine whether a population is growing or declining and what is the rate of that growth or decline. Taking into account these growth and decay rates in conjunction with other factors such as education, housing, food, etc. Scientists and mathematicians can make informed decisions and judgments about how a population is growing or decaying and what steps need to be taken in order to rectify this or fix something. Now that we've covered three very common ways derivatives can be used in the real world, I hope this video has served to give you a holistic and intuitive understanding of what derivatives are. We started with derivatives at a point as just the understanding that they are gradients of tangent lines. We then recognized that a collection of them made a derivative function and these derivative functions can tell us all sorts of things. So I hope this video helped you out. If it did, make sure you subscribe to this channel for more content like this. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. I've also got a video which I'm going to link up here, which goes into depth about the reason we use first and second derivatives when analyzing polynomial functions like cubics and quartics. If that interests you, click that. Otherwise, click the video down below for a YouTube recommendation. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.